and I will have this time. Thank you. So um, we're going to start, I just want to start high level around um, how, you know, grants and RFPs, which is requests for proposals, which are usually more contract or program specific bids, can fit into a nonprofit strategy. From a high level, um, as a nonprofit leader, maybe you're an executive, maybe you're from the financial department, wherever you sit within an organization, grants in general can create a robust fund development arm. So if you have a fund development strategy, grants um, and contract dollars or bid dollars that go out for vendor bids are, are a big arm of that strategy or could be. Um, and there's there's lots of reasons why an organization might seek grants to augment their revenue portfolio. So first and foremost, you know, in the nonprofit lane, oftentimes you get restricted funding for program design or mission specific activities. And those come with a bunch of, like I said, restriction. They come to narrow what you can spend those on. Um, and they can be subject to oftentimes, especially if they're public or government driven, lots of um, ebbs and flows, depending on where we are in a budget year, depending on where we are with legislation passing. So grants are a great way to diversify revenue streams, first and foremost. Bring in new money for innovation. Um, we look towards, from a strategy perspective, what we would hope you would be doing is looking towards grants that really align strategically with your mission and goals. What we say when we're coaching people is don't just chase the dollars, right? You don't want to say yes to what would be bad money, meaning you drift in your mission and your goals so much, it's hard to actually expense those dollars in the right way. There's some risk there. So we start with strategic alignment, looking for grants that really fit um, what you're hoping to do to, you know, support and augment what you're already doing. Um, it also is a way, even small grants are a great way to build partnerships and collaborations, which, which will fit into a larger fund development strategy as far as maybe nurturing larger donors, nurturing in-kind campaigns, um, nurturing program development or impact development in your community as being seen as a leader differently. Small grants can actually really help you get in, in the door that way. And then the fourth area of how they really fit is, you know, there's a lot of money out there that can be used for capacity building and sustainability efforts, right? So if you know certain funding that you have or contract dollars are going to be sunsetting, looking for grants to keep those staff members or those initiatives going, looking for grants that can infuse training, right, can infuse strategy, can infuse leadership development. There's lots of other things that sometimes are hard to fund with traditional nonprofit kind of program dollars or contract dollars, and grants can really support and well round the budget out that way. So lots of capacity building efforts um, are focuses of grants out there too. Next slide, thank you. Um, on the program development side, so that's organizational and fund development strategy side, right, for the larger organization focus, but there's a lot of grants out there on various levels, whether they're local or larger, um, you know, national grants that can be used to address unmet community needs. We oftentimes, in, in the human services field, I'm not sure who everyone is coming from today because there's so many of you. But in nonprofits who are delivering services to the community, a lot of times, um, we notice more of the needs in the community than we are typically able to serve. So we are either trying to help beyond the means of our pocketbooks, right, stretch our budgets in such a way where we can meet people who, you know, you know, meet people in the community who maybe weren't part of the target population or initially or going beyond our financial means. Program development dollars and grants can actually help build extra activities to address those unmet needs that you're seeing maybe first and foremost being kind of grassroots and out there. Fund development in the grant strategy lane can also help us look at piloting or scaling something that we're doing in our nonprofits that we think is innovative or a solution that's not quite funded yet, right? So a lot of times grant makers are looking at innovation, they're looking at pilots, and that can get enough data and research going or enough data and evidence behind it at times for then you to move those fundings from the grant into something in like maybe contract dollars, et cetera. Um, contract or grants can be great also for looking at quality initiatives within an organization or a program. Oftentimes it's really hard to fund that type of uh, self-analysis. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing and are we doing it well? How do we know? That 
takes time and people power and dollars to really do internal looks on ourselves. So certain grants will actually look at and you know pushing quality initiatives and effectiveness, um, not just do more activity, but look at yourselves, right? So that's that innovation, the quality, et cetera. All right, next slide. Like I said, this is an overview. So what do you wanna do if you wanna, say you don't do a tremendous amount of grant development in your, in your nonprofit and you wanna start somewhere. That's what I'm hoping to talk about today. Um, we didn't say it at the beginning, but you know, if you have questions or comments, I think the chat is live, right? And we might not be able to get to all of them, but we will track them all. And I'm happy to put out an FAQ after this as a resource for all of the people who signed up. Um, so please put those in because this is designed to kind of go quickly. Um, but the first thing that you want to understand, if you're going to go down the grants path as an organization, is understanding the grant landscape. What Research the grant opportunities around you, cast a broad net. When you get yourself onto different grant databases, which I'll talk about in a few slides, which are some common ones, you can sign up for those. And what you want to do is you want to build out the keywords that are going to trigger for that grant database to kick you automatic emails when everything, whenever that note or keyword or area of focus gets triggered. You're going to get inundated. Someone will get inundated with all of those search finds, but you're going to start to see what's out there. And that's how you research what grant opportunities exist and who's funding them and who are the eligible people to go for them. It will start to build your internal capacity and knowledge of where funding comes from, and then what you might dial into or get curious about applying for. Understanding the grant landscape and moving into the next steps for yourself really also requires a focus on data, right? Everywhere right now, every grant that we ever see more and more is more moving towards metric-based language, data-informed language. You need to be able to tell your story using data. You need to be able to talk about your mission and your impact of what you're doing or what you plan to do with these dollars with and articulate exactly what they will get as their return on investment from you quantitatively and qualitatively. So data is something to think about as you embark on a new grant strategy. Um, and you use that data to really align with the grant objectives. Um, and that's how you tell your story, creating a compelling story that way. Next. Thank you, Monica. Data is such a big yeah. part of today's world with all this technology, the thing that I was just complaining about, where it all, but also makes this possible for us all to get together and help the nonprofits with their funding. And one of the things Mike Hefferton talks about is as, as businesses are making decisions now, it's a lot more data and information to like look at and mull over to make those strategic decisions. So this just feeds into the use of data to make uh more clear and concise decisions to benefit the nonprofits. This is great. Yeah. I do have one quick question um, yeah. that I've always been curious about. You know, Heffernan has a grant program that is I love, and it's one of our, uh, we give about 60 to 80 grants a year, around a million dollars. So we give them out to nonprofits that support the community. And one of the things I, I was curious about, I know a lot about that grant program, but other grant programs, is there a checks and balances? Like if you give, hey, here's your grant for, $100,000, will they follow up and you may be covering this, I may be jumping ahead, but is there no, a checks okay. and balances on grants? Absolutely. And so anytime somebody gives you money, whether it's private philanthropy and somebody hands you $100 out of their checking account, or they hand you a million dollar grant from Department of Education or National Grant, like whatever it is, right? They're going to want and explicitly detail in the grant app ask as you're proposing for it, what's the reporting and requirements around tracking things like how you spend the money, the impact that you said you were going to have, the activities that you said you were going to do. So you do have to factor in into your grant application, your infrastructure for implementation, what it is that you're going to do to actually be able to report back out on the grant activities, use of funds, et cetera. One additional thing is that there's two different ways to look at money, money that comes from grants, restricted and unrestricted. Restricted mm -hmm. grants are, are the most common. That means I'm going to put this money forward for someone to bid on, for us to give it to them, to do these things that we that's part of our impact that we want to have, whoever the grantee is, right? Or the grantor, sorry. 
that's restricted, which means if you accept those dollars as a nonprofit, you have to do something with it really explicit. Unrestricted grant dollars don't come like they basically are unrestricted in such a way. It's like we want to grant a certain amount of money out because your mission fits what we want to fit, but it doesn't come with like an expected set of deliverable activities. Those unrestricted grants are gold. They're few and far between, but if you can search for them, what they do for a nonprofit is unparalleled. They give you extra cash in your budget to do the things that you really need to do, which might be the unsexy things. Sorry to use that word, but it's not sexy to like pay the increase in your insurance premium. It's not sexy to sell to a donor that you need to do some basic improvements on your facility or your building, your office buildings, right? But those are real costs for nonprofits. So unrestricted grants, I encourage people to look for those too, because then you're not, you know, restricted means you're taking money, but you have to have an output. And sometimes it trusts you know, a lot to have those outputs, unintended costs. So I tell people to really, we look through that lens of discernment, but those are two different ways too, just to, and unrestricted grants have a different type of reporting out. Is that helpful, Steve? Very much, thank you. Very informative as always. You ready for the next <laughs> All slide? All right, let's go forward. Okay. Yeah, next slide, go for it. Okay, so you understand the grant landscape in general. You start researching. Well, who do you research? People are like, Monica, where do I start, right? If you're brand new to this and you're going, where do I start? You're going to start knowing that there's actually different types of grantors, right? There's three primary categories. Um, there's more than this, but three primary categories you might start to be curious about in your grant research. Government agencies, foundations, and corporations. They all give money. Okay, so first and foremost, just know, even as people are talking about how tight the economy right now is, people are still giving money. Okay, companies are incentivized to give money, foundations still have money to give, government agencies and departments across the nation have money to give. So these are still out there. Government grants are really coming from government agencies at the local level. So in California, that would be our county systems um, and county departments. But at the state level, and that's this is actually broadly outside of California, I just assume you guys are mostly from California. Um, that might not be true. Sorry for that assumption. Um, state level and federal level, right? So government grants come from all of those different levels of government, including all of the sectors of government, which means there's a huge range of initiatives from community development and capital development, right? Infrastructure, land development grants, right? Agricultural grants. There's, those come from all kinds of government industry all the way to scientific research grants and demonstration grants to try to prove that the things we think out there are actually real or not. And then really honing in lots of things in the human and social services lens and in the health field lens have grant dollars coming out of various government, whether it's local, state or federal departments, right? These are all highly paid by taxpayer dollars and lots of big you know, uh, legislative initiatives. They're allocated really specifically to meet a public need and priorities that have oftentimes been voted on and then roll out several years later in their funding mechanisms. So one of the major ways to stay on top of this is know what's happening legislatively in your local and state area and federally, and know that when something new is passing, very soon after, six months, a year later, you might start seeing the money trickle. Because once something passes, then they got to figure out the funding and allocation methodology, and then they start delivering that in the form of grants. So tracking that's important. Um, what else? That's all I kind of want to say. Oh, actually, I will say one thing. Taking government money is probably the most restrictive you'll get as far as the most rigorous oversight the most rigorous adherence to regulations and reporting. So coming, you know, government money comes usually with a lot of infrastructure oversight and need for reporting and evaluation. You know, we have somebody on our team, we have two people on our team that specifically do grant management. So we not only try to get the grants, but then we'll like help the implementation and do the research evaluation and reporting because that's a robust infrastructure that not everybody can have. So sometimes it's like contracted it out. Um, but that's options too for people. But know that government money comes usually with those more strict, if you will, guidelines. Next slide. Probably not a shot. Probably not a shot. <laughs> right, I know. What? The government's not just going to give us money and just say, go spend it? Um, okay. 
Foundation grants are amazing too. So foundations um, are super broad. There's lots of different types of foundations out there, but foundations are by definition also nonprofits, right? They're non nonprofit organizations whose mission is to support other charitable causes. So they seek dollars through philanthropy and donations and endowments and all of that. They actually get dollars with the intent to pass them out, right? To grant them out for specific um, focus areas that they feel uh, committed to or tied to wanting to see an impact. This is where social services and human services nonprofits and community-based organizations who are supporting a broader community need oftentimes will align very nicely with foundation grants because foundations are looking at charitable causes like health, education, environment, um, homelessness, um, what else? Workforce development, independence, all these areas of mostly human development, right? Community development. So foundations are great. Foundation grant makers do establish guidelines and priorities for funding, and they do usually put out detailed funding requests that you would respond to. And they do have reporting guidelines as well um, because they need to be able to report out what they did with the money that was given to them. So there is a reporting element for this as well. All right, next slide. Often overlooked, mostly in nonprofits, um, especially human service nonprofits, right? We look at the first two grants mostly, but corporate grants should not go on, you know, unsleuthed, if you will. Um, corporations are incentivized through corporate social responsibility initiatives to support community development. If you run a corporation in a community, there, you are incentivized to give back to that community in some way. And so oftentimes corporate um, corporate businesses have philanthropic end to them. Hello, Steve just talked about Heffernan's philanthropic end, right? They're a corporation trying to give back in some ways. So you could also spend some time researching the local larger corporations in your communities that and under, making calls, understanding what is their giving? What are they committed to? What are some of their change initiatives that they're leaning into? And, and do they have a grants program? Secondly, they don't just give in cash. Sometimes they give in kind, or you can seek them for things like sponsorships for your events or programming. So that can actually lead you into a larger grant application later on. So no what connecting with your local corporations and understanding their giving strategy is really important from a fund development um, lane or st larger strategy in general that might open you up to be a grantee applicant eligible grantee down the line. Steve, go ahead. Well, I have some <laughs> questions because um, the corporate giving. So Heffernan created a foundation. Right. So Heffernan mm -hmm. has the Heffernan Foundation that has a separate board that decides where the grants will go. So that would be a foundation, not a corporation. But it's okay. a, but or, or I'm asking kind of I guess it's kind of a foundation and a corporation because that's the way the corporation gives their giving through their foundation. Would you think that? Yeah, kind it's of kind of both. Yeah, th that does happen. So sometimes larger corporations will have a philanthropic arm that they actually make their own foundation themselves and funnel money through directly and or solicit money to. Um, and some larger corporations just have a corporate giving strategy, a social responsibility strategy. And oftentimes like they'll even encourage their employees to kick into that, right? And then their employees are incentivized with maybe a match and different things like that. So it, it's just the business structure of it. My point in this bringing it up doesn't really matter the business structure. Just know that corporations oftentimes do have giving and we forget to ask them a lot of the time. We just forget I to totally them. agree. And you see um, so much, especially since we're in the year of politics and for better or worse, it does make uh, the environment a little more stressful for people, I think is fair to say. And yeah. a lot of this, what I'm seeing is taxing corporations and the, the wealthy where I see this going, if you can go to your business partners too and the corporations and say, hey, do you guys want to support the community? I went into a health center here seeing if they wanted to support our Hands for Hope nonprofit event. And the receptionist 
was there. She said, no, he's not available. I said, well, I was just curious. Does he, do you guys like to support nonprofits and you know, the community? She said, no. And I was like, are you sure he would say that if I asked the owner of the business <laughs> if he would like to? So I think there's a shift a little bit and a good message where you can go to corporations now, say, what kind of philanthropy are you doing? Would you like to partner with, uh, with us or increase what you're already doing? Because that message is going to be one of the headlines. I think we know about Amazon or Bezos' wife, you know, and all the giving she does, and she's not stopping. It's amazing. And uh, I hope more corporations and individuals start to do that. So just another yeah. nugget to chew on there. Yeah. And the larger um, the larger the corporation, um, the more you should expect that you have to compete for the dollars they're putting out, which means the, the more rigorous your... Um, your storytelling about your impact and what you're going to do with it has to be, which means that data has got to be pretty dialed in. You have to have a clear community-based need and impact need that you're trying to make that you can articulate. So just think about like the bigger the company, probably the more competition and the more savvy your grant uh, proposal has to be. Smaller corporations, you might have less competition and it's a great way to get ingrained. Once you've been given money for a particular initiative, no matter where it comes from, you can reference that you've already received money like that and you did a really good job with it, et cetera. And then it makes other funders or larger funders more enticed to support the cause as well. So um, it shows like you have a track record of responsible um, spending and use of grant dollars. So you can start small, you can start big, shoot for the moon, go to Coca-Cola, you can go to the Bezos of the world, or you can start locally with some of your, you know, smaller mid to um, size businesses in your community. Go ahead, you're going to say. Fantastic. The one thing I wanted to add, and I had this thought, someone just reminded me. Um, some of the reason I know that for Heffernan, for instance, we separate the foundation. It allows a little bit less of the kind of the red tape. You have your business operations here. So the foundation can focus 100% on the foundation philanthropy and giving. So it is also yeah. book bookkeeping and other benefits to doing that, which allows the corporation to give more than keeping it on the corporate level, right? And, yeah, and the true. growth of those funds too. Um, yeah. So on that note, I will go to the next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for moderating me. Okay. So now you know how to do the research. You've got some ideas about like what to look for, et cetera. Maybe you get curious and start to talk to people or, you know, know what they fund, but how do you craft a compelling proposal? There's things to really consider right off the beginning. You have to have a data-driven narrative. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm a horse owner, so I don't like to say beating a dead horse, that old saying, but like really truly data-driven narrative, data-driven narrative, whatever you have to do. And, and don't get don't get scared. You're like, I'm ready to hang up. We don't have any infrastructure, Monica, to tell us about data or to pull numbers. Pause and go back. What data-driven means is do you have any evidence at all? And that can include testimonials, uh, participant or consumer satisfaction surveys, even demographics of your own staff or demographics of your community. There's every community out there tends to do what's called an annual community needs assessment. Pull those, poach that data. Use the data that other people have created to inform why you are going to seek and get money, right? Like how you seek and spend money. So it doesn't have to be just your own data. It's data in general to support your narrative and incorporate as many statistics and metrics that illustrate the project need and that you understand the project's needs as they've been laid out, why they're offering the money. Um, the other really important logistical thing that most people forget about is that there's actually a lot of um, prep work before you can oftentimes submit for one of these grants. Um, there's required credentials, especially if we're talking about government level grants, um, that you need to have as an organization to even be able to put the application in. So that would be a DUNS number or a SAM registration, or now what's being called, it's actually being newly titled Unique Entity Identifier. This is the government's recognition of you as an entity that could receive funding. And you need to actually get this before you could submit a grant. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time. So if you don't have it and the grant has a deadline, you may not actually get that number in time to submit. So right now, the low hanging fruit I could tell everyone on this call to go do is if your organization doesn't have these, go get them. Just apply for them, get these numbers, keep them. If you never use them once, that's fine. You never used them. But if you have them, the world opens up for what you can apply for. And what you never want to get caught on is we could totally fit this money, but we have no way to apply. 
because we're missing that number. So go through those. I actually can tell you the steps to do those if you want, um, but you can also research that. The second major logistic is, um, one more, um, most often in the same way you have to pre-register for grant portal accounts, and that can take a little bit of time and be that technology thing that Steve joked about, right? You never want to get hung up on not being able to submit a brilliantly written proposal because of the technology and the accounts not logged in or verified. So get all of that ahead of time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, next. So tailor the proposal. You're going to read, read, read with as much depth as you can the grant application and all of the hyperlinks that they give you in that grant application that reference why they put the grant together. There's oftentimes lots of supportive documentation that's hyperlinked that most people forget to look at that actually tells them the story of how to customize their proposal, tells them what it is that the grantors are looking for, that you have a broad understanding or deep understanding of what they're trying to fund. So customize that Customize your proposal to that. It sounds simplistic, like Monica, duh, how 101 can you get? But oftentimes people miss the mark of this, right? When you know you do grant reviews, you're like, they miss a lot of points in that because they could have seen what the community impact statement said if they'd you know followed the link. Um, I'm not even gonna say it again, align data and metrics, absolutely. Um, demonstrate your understanding of their goals and the way that you create your goals really clearly will support them in reporting on their goals. That's the link and bridge you wanna make. When you generate objectives or logic models or goals specific to what you'll do with the money, it has to have a direct line in some way that that grantor says, oh, if they did this really well, we meet our goals too. Cause they have to report out with what they're doing with the money too, right? They're passing it through, but they ultimately have to justify that, they, that it met the ultimate need as well. And then budgeting and financial planning is a huge piece of grant administration. Um, if you have historical data for cost and um, expenses and your P&Ls, really pull those to create a realistic budget that aligns with the objectives and understand that yes, sometimes they'll go with, you know, pro they might go with the lowest proposal. So they, you know, you don't wanna overshoot or you're trying to fit it into how much the grant actually is. But don't cut yourself short, right? Really budget and plan appropriately because the worst thing is to lose money on a grant you thought you were going to make money on, right? Because your budgeting was off. So be really realistic with your costs, pull historical data. The people who are evaluating grants really do look at budgets and, and look at budget justification. How did you come to these numbers? You know, what evidence did you have that this is actually your cost structure? And that will also go into your reporting. Okay, so really, you know, look, financial responsibility with grant money is one of the major make or breaks for whether you get awarded. Next. Yep, go ahead. Quick question. Uh, I think we don't need to wait for a fact sheet for these. Uh, the Dunn's number, does that expire? I think you do a renewal. Um, okay, so your SAM registration, I believe you do an annual renewal. You pay to like keep that number up in some way. The DUNS number, I don't know that it expires, but you have to keep it up. I think once you get one, it you don't it can't be like given to somebody else after. It's your number, but you keep it up. And the unique it's funny, I, I'm on such autopilot with those. I'm like, wait, I think SAMS is every year. And <laughs> yeah, what was your next question? Um UEI number. Where do you I mean, do you just kind of search online to find out where to find that or get your UEI number? So what you're going to do is you're going to see that UEI and DUNS are basically being used interchangeably now. There's been a shift a little bit in the language. Um, so sometimes it'll say DUNS, sometimes it'll say UEI, but that's mostly for things that you're going to find in government grants that are going to require you to have that. Excellent. I have some other questions in. I'm going to save some of them for the end that I think are more applicable afterwards. So here back to our regularly scheduled presentation. I hope that people are finding this useful too. It's so hard to do a webinar and not see everybody. Um, okay, next. Oh, no, this is it. Um, when you can, right? So it's really important. Relationship is key. So the worst thing to do, like if you guys want to, we'll step back and just say grants is just one area of fund development, right? So let's talk about another one, which is like major donors. 
The worst thing is to meet somebody who has money that you think has a mission alignment with yours and ask them for their money right off with no relationship. That is such a cold ask. Sometimes that results in them saying yes, but very rarely. You usually have to nurture donorship, right? In the same way, sometimes we have to conceptualize nurturing grantiships, right? We have to understand how do we connect with the entities, whether they're government officials whether they're foundation officials or corporate officials, like how do we meet and create relationship and visibility with them first? Invite them to your organizations, invite them to events that you have, have your consumers or clients, whoever you serve in the community, be present and talk to them. Have broad reach as far as things like newsletters or your own annual report push, um, social media, have some kind of communication platforms that you're using to compel relationship before you they see you put a grant forward, right? Usually that's really helpful because then someone who's on the review panel goes, oh man, I hear about them. They do great work. Or I know that person. I went to one of their events last year and it was really inspiring, right? That isn't in your, like that weighs into their scoring of you, that relationship that weighs into their trust of you that you're gonna be able to use their money wisely and meet their needs, right? It also goes a long way because grantors wanna partner, they wanna give their money, not just to the person that's gonna do the best with it, but that's gonna be easy and, and good to work with, right? You're gonna be in a relationship with them if they give you money for whatever length of time that grant goes for, a year, two years, more than that. They want someone who's good to partner it. You know, that is essential for them. So. You really want that effective communication, establishing that trust, do what you're going to say, you do what you say you're going to do, report out on it, stay timely, let them know if there's any kind of problem, invite them in before, right? Celebrate them, recognize them, give them accolades if they're giving you money or attention or any sponsorship. That relationship is priceless. It's gold. So any way you can nurture that, your grant success will go up for sure. All right. Again, this is high level. Um, here are some of the most common sites that we are connected to. So I said in the beginning, you know, our our organization, my company, we do this. We I'm I'm on two. I'm writing two right now that are due next week. Right. Like we are writing grants regularly, but we also are sourcing grants regularly for our client base. Right. So companies that work with us. We, we input their keywords in, into the databases if we're already connected with them and help kick them to them. Hey, this looks like something you might do based on your mission. You, you can sign up for all of these yourself as an organization. You can get an account with grants.gov if you don't have them. You can look for the foundation directory, the grantsmanship center. You can sign up for their releases. Some of these are paid um, databases to be involved in. So you have a subscription so that you can log in and search or, or get their alerts. But if you're going to try to build a robust grant strategy for fund development, it's money well spent to have these databases in your expense structure. Um, so that's one thing. Paying for the databases is one thing. You have to have some time and focus on reviewing the things that get sent to you. So you can belong to any number of grant sites or databases and get large numbers of grants that are out there kicked into your email box someone's got to actually go through them and go, nope, 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 maybe, yep, nope, and kick those somewhere for communication and decision-making. Oftentimes what I see is that people get very excited about grants, but the reality of how busy we all are trumps the ability to stay on top of what's being released. And then it's hard to jump on something that's already been out for a little while and, and come up with a compelling narrative. So I would encourage organizations to either Utilize supports like, you know, that are out there, whether it be us or anybody else who already sleuths this regularly. <laughs> and then those are already dug through and then kicked to you strategically. Or have someone on your team whose job it is to regularly be checking these databases if, if you're trying to actually expand this part of your fund strategy. So I have to ask now, you've used it twice, unsleuthed and sleuthed. Could you please oh. give me the definition of sleuthed? Oh, sleuth, like like a sleuth, like a detective, like to find. Isn't sleuth like a I just like have the slow like... moving, the slow moving guys. That's no, what that's I'm sloth. Okay. Sleuth, no, I think. I so search, <laughs> dig through. Um, I like it. Explore, to come through. Detect, to come through. Okay. I got through. you. I got you. It's Perfect. funny. I didn't realize I was saying that. 
No, everybody's got their terms. I used to say whatnot a lot. Now I stopped that. So if you ever hear me, feel free to nudge me or kick me. Um, on this is web. one of the reasons we want to have this webinar at Heffernan too. We have the large grant program and Heffernan employees are allowed to nominate up to three uh, nonprofits a year for the grant program. And it's just one of the things that drives us crazy is when we are trying to give money to nonprofits supporting the community and they say, we can't, we don't have time. We don't have money. I don't know how, where do we get started? I just can't, you know, do all those yeah. things. And so if we, we felt this was a good way to try and help make these grants more possible for the nonprofits to whether it's find time to do it internally, like you're doing or work with Monica or, or someone else, however it is, just trying to get more money to the nonprofits is really the goal here. Um, and that yeah. this is so helpful. Thank you. So I'll go to the next slide, I assume. Yes, please do. And I will add one little piece to that, which is um, in real time, it costs money to make money this way. So I do want to name that that's a real thing. If somebody, you know, it's you either have to find and carve out internal resources and time to write grants, which is which is money. Time is money in our businesses. Right. Um, or you pay a grant writer on contract to deliver, you know, to do a very a project based grant. Sometimes we just we not sometimes lots of times we just get asked to do the writing, you know, help us write this because we have no one on our team who either knows how to do it or has the time, quite frankly, could, could totally do it if they weren't doing eight other jobs. But that is an investment, right? That is a line item. You know, you have to carve out some kind of cost, whether it's resource or actual money to make larger money through grants. So I do encourage people to think about that in their budget strategies every year. You know, what type of um, fund development dollars, including potentially looking at grant writing or sourcing, um, do you put aside or consider maybe in your budget? Um, to support this effort, because it does it does actually cost money to make money sometimes this way, especially with development. And we're seeing a big trend right now. I think I've introduced you to three or actually almost five nonprofits in yeah. the last few months that have lost their funding development, individual department passion through COVID because it had mm -hmm. to kind of shut down. The gala stopped, this stopped, that stopped. We moved to online donations, that sort of thing. Online fundraisers, which worked a little, you know, but not as much fun. So it's always how you make them feel at these things too, to keep them coming back and keep them as sticky donors and sticky uh, contributors to your nonprofit. So um, before we jump into this slide, Monica, I was thinking I could yeah. jump over because this is- Whatever you want to do, you're, yeah. This is a blank space. Here, So a couple of things that we <laughs> wanted to talk about, again, not too much about the insurance, but we're going to try and keep people on. I love to see the numbers. And if they start to drop, I just shut up and give it back to Monica. Um, fun development, a few fun things that you can also do that's easy is an ice cream social. I work with some um, uh, handles ice cream up here. And so what they can do is come to a nonprofit and they will do a marketing kind of outward facing. So you can invite your donors, invite other nonprofits, invite the chamber, invite whoever you want, everyone, put on your LinkedIn, all the things, uh, all the other social media things I'm not aware of. And then what you, we do is like, you can buy the ice cream for your participants of your programs or your case managers. I like to do that for my clients. And then the rest is fundraising. So everybody else is, signs onto the QR code and does a $20 ice cream donation or 10 or maybe more. So it's just more of a small fundraiser to get your face out there and, and your name out there more. Other ones that are fairly easier are poker parties, if you're into that sort of thing. Sometimes it's not right for the not specific nonprofit. Um, and then bingo is a little bit easier to accept sometimes, or even bunko. I put the question mark because I know my mom's played it for like 40 years. I have no idea what it is. Um, it's a dice game. It's super fun. I thought it was, okay, it's dice. Um, so a couple of fun ideas that we've helped with in the past and that are pretty easy once they've been done a few times. Um, my sister was a philanthropy director at youth homes in the Bay Area and did these, had a back 40, a barbecue uh, restaurant with an upstairs facility, donate the place, major discount on food, prizes were donated. So again, looking at those partners, those corporate partners to make this fundraiser very inexpensive for you to get the most out of it for your organization. Mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, I like, I put Wizard of Oz, anytime I talk about these things, it sounds to me like Wizard of Oz, dividends, captives, and partially funded programs, oh my. 
So again, not talking too much insurance, but I believe the needle is moving. You can see umbrella limits are coming down for a lot of nonprofits. And that's because the capacity is less that they can offer out in the market. And that's a lot more detailed than that, but I'll keep it short for the purposes of this call. So the reason is they want less they want less risk because they've been paying out. There were 28 losses in the United States, over a billion dollars last year. So that means the carriers paid that money out. That's not the government that you have the contract with that's asking for the $20 million limit. It's not available anymore. The insurance carriers are the one paying. So they're the ones that really look at the, this stuff with a fine tooth comb and really sleuth through all of the details of your policies and coverage. So as they want to get less capacity out there, offering less, they want less risk because they want to pay out less. So if the end user, the nonprofit or the business itself, the for-profit, if you will, will take some of that risk, that is where you have captives, where you have some skin in the game. So you can get more money back and have less of the overall costs. Put this into your programs, into more fund development. Another one is dividend programs where you don't have as much skin in the game, but based off of your losses, you can get a return. If you have for instance, you can get up to 40% back on in some programs on your auto, your workers' compensation, and some other programs as well, like health benefits, which I kind of outlined here. A whole lot of bullet points on there, a little bullet point heavy, but that's okay. So just looking at these, and when you're looking at your renewals, you know, are there any ways that you can get a return on your insurance programs moving forward? I believe this is kind of where the industry may be moving if the insurance carriers continue to get these large lo catastrophic losses on an annual basis. Now I'm going to go back also, to your thing. Yeah, I think it's also where we might see industries like insurance, and we, you and I have talked about this, getting really creative about how to reinvest for their client base and in philanthropic ways, right, which can include expanding their own granting you know, granting or fund strategy out. So reinvesting in that and then offering it back for our, a bid, basically a proposal to then source those dollars back to it ultimately goes back to the their customer base anyways. So yeah, really exciting. It also brought up for me that one of the, the budgeting and financial considerations around grants to consider is um, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes a grantor will ask in your budget or require in your budget that the organization is going to contribute a certain percentage of what's called match dollars to the dollars that they're giving you. So, you know, for if you're going to get a grant of $25,000, there's 10% or 5% match that they require that could be in kind or coming out of your other program funded budgets or out of your dividends or payouts for the, you know, at the end of the year from that. Somehow the organization is putting a little skin in the game to match the large contribution or the contribution that's getting so it's really important to think about whether it's what you know steve you're describing as far as getting a return on their investment in some way um how that can contribute to match at the end of the day um but just extracting about thirty thousand feet and going back to the budgeting it that's an important piece for an organization to know how they will meet that match requirement and always be looking for that when you're reading through the grant requirements so Okay, how are we doing on time? We are like there on time. We're doing great. Um, I got two questions when you're ready for yes. it, Monica. You no, ready go to for it. Let's shoot do it. now? Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, AI is out there nowadays. And yes. uh, for better or worse, for good or bad, I think it can be all of the above. Um, there are some smaller nonprofits that don't have the capacity to develop and write grants. Are you seeing organizations use AI? Yes. So I am, and I, so because you asked, am I seeing it? The answer is yes. Uh, let me throw in some uh, tips and tricks and or considerations, right? AI is about infancy in its age right now, really truly. And so it will kick out errors. We'll make, up, like you have to double check, especially if you're trying to do a data-driven response. If you verify, or if you, have AI help you write some content or pull data for you. You can ask a prompt to AI, tell me the statistics of the percentage of blah, 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 blah in our local community, right? And they give you statistics. You just got to know that you check back in some way against the verified before you put that out there if it's strictly AI generated. So I always caution people that whatever's coming out of AI, if it seems um, tied to fact, you just want to fact check yourself because the worst thing would be to put something out there that's not right. Um, so whatever's coming out of AI, make sure you have human eyes and human common sense and, and a readership on it before you push it forward. 
it, that would go without saying whether you were writing it yourself or not. You'd get another set of eyes, right? The review process is really important before you submit. But yes, I am seeing uh, people thinking through how the use of AI could streamline or help them fine tune the ways to write certain things or move something from what seems like narrative style to more technical writing style. Um, I'm seeing it for sure. I don't know that it'll ever replace the human writing just because it has to get read back so many times. Maybe it will. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something right now that most people are chewing on. I believe that it is a support. So I believe, yeah. you know, for writing, at least for me, I like my personal con my personal touch. So I'll write it and then maybe get a little AI and then I'll rewrite it again. If I really need to write it three times. Um, our last question for now, um, any, we'll let you, then we'll wrap up and any others that come in afterwards, we can follow up with and put the fact sheet together Perfect. like Monica mentioned earlier. Um, I'll, I'll also be recording this, as I mentioned, and sending it out to folks. Uh, to see if you'd like to watch it again or pass it on to your team or that new fund development manager you're starting to hire because of all these great tips from Monica. So our last question. Oh, now there's another one. Oh, this is a helpful note, so I'll read this one. I use Grammarly and then use their AI to see if it makes it sound better or more streamlined. Grammarly. Nice. That's, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, okay, question. One option for smaller nonprofits without grant writing capacity can be to partner with larger organizations that can take them on as a sub grantee. Yep. I've so never knew that existed. that's a great existed. strategy. Uh, yeah, that's a thing. Um, I actually, we work on a bunch of those as well, right? Where we're writing on behalf of the lead and multiple subs, and it's a collective effort. Um, a smaller organization absolutely can um, kind of hang their hook into a larger organization that has a more robust infrastructure to not just write the grant, but administer the grant if they actually get it, right? Like getting the grant, you got to administer, you got to follow up and do all the things you said you're going to do. So um, absolutely just that makes it easier for a smaller entity to have their hands in maybe that innovative or community-based effort or initiative, but not have to do the higher level infrastructure reporting, et cetera. That's actually why people hire us. I mean, this you know to be self-serving or whatever but to tell you what we do that's why people actually hire us to do the writing and the grant administration and the infrastructure and the reporting they just get to do the great work or they get to do you know the activities that they wanted as the sub um we definitely have done that as well um because it can well, be expensive right if you want to go for something larger but don't have the infrastructure and that's such so valuable like you said you you have to spend a little bit of money to make money and oftentimes most of the time that is the the issue so when you don't have, if you don't have the time, you can reach out to Monica, see what the dollars and cents is. Is the grant worth spending a little money to hire Monica or another consultant? Don't just say no all the time, or you might just not even have the time to call a consultant. And if that's the case, it might just be what it is. But we're here. If you make the call, you can pass off some of that responsibility onto somebody that can really fight for you, that knows what the questions and how, how to outline it all, like Monica's outlined with us today. Um, Monica, and let, me, let me just say... There yeah, go. I gotta say one more thing on that. Um, one of the things that I think we're pretty good at and I make my team do and I do is tell people when to say no to money. So that's the first conversation is we we know enough about the funders oftentimes or the the government entities or the where the funding's coming from, or you know, we try to get to know the businesses that are asking us to help them enough to go, you if it were me, I wouldn't touch this money. Like if it were me, I wouldn't take this on. Or, you know, you might want to consider this and this before you decide. Oftentimes it comes with this type of follow-up or headache, or I've seen it, you know, where it's been more trouble than it's worth. So that's actually partially because we have done so many of them over the years, but also our subject matter expertise in some of the human services field, right? We'll go like, you don't really want to do that, or you need to get in front of this money, do whatever you can right now to get in front of it and be one of the first people because you want it, right? So that's another piece to your point is, Hoping to actually make those decisions and discern when would you take the money or not, or when should you go for it, throw your hat in the ring or not. And walking away from money is just as important as throwing your grant hat in the ring, really, like not doing it too. Because sometimes the worst thing you get is like, oh God, we got that thing. Darn it. What are we going to do with that? <laughs> so we weren't ready. So that's it. I'm, I guess I'll say, unless there's any other questions. Well, I do have one minute. more now. Um, okay. So this will be the last one, and then you can say your closing statement. Um, last thing, this will be recorded. I've had that cop 
question pop up a couple of times and we will be getting it out to attendees because we want you to be able to share this with other folks in your organization um, and other nonprofits. Feel free to call Monica and I. This last question comes from a nonprofit, one of my favorite newer nonprofits called Little Miracles, helping babies out there. Um, we actually donated our my old baby crib, which meant a lot to me to them. So this one, when applying for an unrestricted grant and they give you a range, say, we'll say you'd like two to 15,000, 20,000. Is there a strategy to better your odds for first time requests? Mm. So if your first time are coming in, because the grants come out often, right? So now they've seen you, yeah. they kind of seen you, you haven't gotten it, but there's your first time. Is there some things you can do? And at the same note, if you've tried for a grant for four years and haven't got it, do you just stop or do you just kind of start over? Do you switch it up? What it, Those two points that we'll close with that, if you could, Monica. Okay, I'm going to start there. If you've tried for a grant for four years and never gotten it or four cycles, I would hope that before you ever got to the fourth, someone's reaching out after the grant closes because usually they can't talk to you during it because they could see this favoritism. Reach out to whoever it is and be like, hey, can we get some feedback on our grant? We'd love to know how it read. We'd love to know the scoring. We'd love to know your thoughts on our approach. We really want to work with you guys or we really are, you know, our visions align with you. You know, give us some feedback huge for relationship development, huge for self-learning. You might just be saying one word that lags the reviewers of going, oh, they're not, they don't actually understand. That's like not a word that we use at our organization. You had no idea, right? Or you might say client and they're like, nope, that automatically we, we want to say, you know, consumer. Sometimes it's that nuance. People are like, oh, they just don't get, that's our culture. So if you've done four grant cycles and not gotten it before you put your fifth one in, make sure someone has reached out um, and reach out outside of the new grant coming out. Okay. So not just during the time the grants out Two, is there a strategy for if there's a range or a ceiling? Some people are like, we're just always going to go for the max because we're a nonprofit and we always need the money. And there's always something to fund. What I would say is if it's your first one with them out the gate, think of the thing that you think is the no brainer. It's the no brainer for you to do without a tremendous overhaul of yourself that you know you can do well and knock out of the park and, and kill the outcomes of, and that you know is really needed and is the number one that matches to their purpose, like why they're putting it out. And whatever that costs, if it's within the range, ask for that. We do that really well because then next you get to do the stretch thing, the thing where like, ooh, we want them to fund this also. Do the thing that you know that you can just kill it, right? That you already have data on. That's going to be a, a, an augmentation of something you already do. So, and then whatever that costs, if it's in the range, you ask for that. That's my suggestion right off the cuff. Awesome. Fantastic. I think the corporate relationships, you know, the thing I remember, and I say it all the time in just life, is they always remember how you make them feel. So if you want to get these folks to come and know and learn, invite them to your events, make sure they're included in your newsletters, make sure they're in all those communications, all the fun stuff that you are all doing, because you do a lot of fun and you do a lot of good. So let them know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, Monica, anything else, closing statements? No, I appreciate the time. I know that some people it's right at that time, a little over what a way to spend lunch with you guys. Um, reach out directly, um, introduce yourselves directly, call if you want to set up any kind of stuff with us to know what we do more, how we could help. Um, but I'm super excited to have had this opportunity. Thanks for inviting me to do this. And I hope one nugget at least was useful for people. Very much. Lots to sleuth through. Um, and thank you so much, Monica, for joining us. I really appreciate uh, all the knowledge you've given me and everybody else on this call. So thanks so much. A lot of thank yous coming in now. And then one last tidbit and tip. Don't forget to tag those funders on your posts and pictures. 100%. All right, 100%. there we go. Pictures, follow-up, accolades, yes. Well, All now right. go get some lunch and start the weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you, Monica. Bye, thank you, Monica. Bye everybody. Take care.